good friend, my good friend, actually, good man, Mike Lee, Senator of Utah. Mike, how are you, sir? Doing great, Mark. Thank you very much. All right, Mike, we've got this this constant push to destroy our electoral system, our constitutional structure, all for the purpose of empowering the Democrat Party and turning our election system into California's election system. That's what Nancy Pelosi has in her mind right now. Then we have West Virginia's mansion who's constantly uh, ice skating on a, uh, on a line here, uh, trying not to go too far, but on the other hand, trying to throw stuff to his party. And he's come up with some ideas which really are milk toast. And so is this now what's being pushed? And is this now the uh, sheep in uh, wolf's clothing or or wolf in sheep's clothing, I should say? Look, this is a bad bill. And even if you water it down, it's still a watered down bad bill. Yeah, uh, Yeah. It, it, this is this is something that is, is not really going to make it easier to vote. It's just going to make it easier to vote illegally. It makes election fraud easier to commit and harder to find and punish by by forcing the states essentially to allow unlimited ballot harvesting, undermining overwhelmingly popular voter ID laws, and making it harder to maintain accurate voter lists. But one of the worst things uh, about it is that it would... Uh, not only allow, but in many instances require federal taxpayer dollars to go to fund partisan campaigns. I mean, this is absolutely insane. This would say that uh, six dollars uh, of federal taxpayer money would be spent uh, uh, and, and, and delivered to all political candidates for every one dollar that they raise from small dollars. I was talking to some of my colleagues the other day, and one of them was pointing out that uh, in that colleague's race, there would have been something like $80 million to that candidate's campaign mm-hmm. from the federal government. This is wrong. And you know what happens when the federal government gets to send taxpayer dollars to somebody's campaign? That means they're also deciding who legitimate candidates are and are not. That starts to feel awfully draconian and something the American people are not inclined to accept. Other than on the civil rights side, why would we want the federal government involved in any of this? We know our history. The history is that the states get to decide. I went back and I read some of the uh, state uh, ratification conventions, and they made it clear this was priority number one. They wanted to control the manner in which uh, uh, officials were chosen, or they would not have adopted the Constitution. And now it's as if our history doesn't matter The Democrats want to centralize all power. They want to have all power so they can control all power. It's all about the Democrat Party, isn't it? Yes. And you you have to ask the question, Tui Bono, who benefits from that? You benefit from that if you want to be able to manipulate the system. It's a lot easier to manipulate one system than it is 50 state systems or 50 states times however the average number of uh, counties there, there are. It's a lot easier to manipulate when you can consolidate. And that's why consolidation leads to corruption. That, by the way, Mark, as you were alluding to, that's exactly why the Founding Fathers put this power in Article 1, Section 4, but limited that power to time, place, and manner restrictions specifically on U.S. senators and representatives. Outside of that narrow context, we don't have any business legislating on election law. Hmm. Any business Uh, 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 passing laws determining how states conduct elections. That is entirely up to the states. Let me ask you something. You're in the Senate. You watch this stuff going back and forth. I told you maybe many years ago that a dear friend of mine and a mentor of mine, Senator Paul Laxalt of Nevada, Ronald Reagan's buddy, when I was a young man, I visited the Senate. I didn't know Senator Laxalt. He was nice enough to meet me. I mean, I was from Pennsylvania, not Nevada. But I was agreeing with the president or president-to-be on the Panama Canal. And I wanted to meet Paul Laxalt because he was taking the lead on this. And I sat with him, my father and I did, and he must have given us 40 minutes. And one of the things he said to me, Mike, was, every day this body meets, we lose a little bit of our liberty. That has stuck with me for 43 years. It's true, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely true. And it becomes more true, Mark, every single day that passes when we, as Americans, are asked 
by the mainstream news media, by the entertainment industry, and also by uh, our academic establishment in America, where it has to accept this deeply flawed assumption that passing legislation is, in the abstract, a, a, a good thing, that it's an unmitigated good to pass things. We forget the fact that, you know, passing something isn't always the right thing. And in fact, a lot of the time, it's just adding to the complexity of the law, which operates as a sort of subsidy for the already wealthy and well-connected. It's actually a, an impairment to liberty, and that's why the Founding Fathers made it very difficult to pass federal legislation and limited that further by limiting the subject matter of what we could even legislate on. That's why I get very frustrated with people saying, oh, the problem with Washington is that nothing can get done, nothing can get passed because there's all, all this gridlock. Mark, you, you don't get to be $28 trillion in debt without a whole lot of bipartisanship. You don't get to the point where you've got $2 trillion of annual regulatory compliance costs at the federal level without a whole lot of Republicans and a whole lot of Democrats agreeing to empower unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats at the expense of individual liberty. There's a whole lot of bipartisanship going on here, and it doesn't always end well. No, you're exactly right. But I have to say, what we're going through today is different than what we went through two, three, five, eight years ago. This is more radical... This is more aggressively anti-constitutional, anti-capitalist, more Marxist-oriented than anything I've ever seen in my life. This is, this is a, uh, a time for reckoning here, whether or not we're going to be able to hold on to what we have or not, don't you think? Yes, and it's also markedly different in that the sentiment around it is different. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I used to... Um, have much more of a sense in Washington that there was a, a good faith collegiality uh, among and between the two parties. Lately, I get the sense, especially on things like S-1, that these guys aren't just... That's the federal kind of voting uh, law proposal. It, yes, the federal voting law proposal. The, the, the Illegal Voting Act, if you will, or the Corrupt Politicians mm. Act, if you want to call it that. It's not just that they dislike Republican state voting reforms. In fact, this legislation was drafted long before 2021. This has been around for a couple of years. They did this not just because they dislike Republican state voting reforms. They dislike Republicans. They don't want Republicans to win elections anymore. And if we pass legislation like this, that'll be the case. It, it, it'll be the closest thing to what we've ever known as an institutional party in America. That's what the Democratic Party will become if this passes. All right, my friend, uh, we're about to lose our time here. I want to thank you very much. Now, real quick, what's the likelihood it'll pass? Likelihood it passes is very low this week, but we've got to remain ever vigilant.